Um, welcome back, everyone. We've got a smaller group live today, small but mighty. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I've personally had a lot of thoughts that have been coming up for me in my personal life, you know, over the past few weeks with our first two conversations about mass incarceration, the criminal legal system. Um, Yvonne's unable to join us right now. She's got an in-person meeting, so she might hop on a little bit later, but we'll get started without her. Part of why we wanted to share an episode on the idea of restorative justice is as we transition to some of the topics we wanna to talk about this summer as a community, um, we're gonna be talking more about violence. And I think this, this episode and this framing of restorative justice and community harm repair is really helpful as we continue doing that internal and external work of, of peace building when it comes to thinking about what is violence, who is harmed, and how do we move through that as communities um, making sure that everyone is part of the process of reducing violence and harm. As we've been talking about mass incarceration, criminal justice reform, a lot of times that conversation starts after the harm has been done and is focused on retribution or punishment or deterrence, not on healing and repair. Um, there's a couple of points I want to tease out in case folks haven't listened to this podcast recently or, or haven't had a chance to yet. I highly encourage you to listen to them talk about it themselves. Um, and explore the Common Justice website because they do a, a much better deep dive into what exactly this looks like and it means. But there's a couple of pieces I want to tease out. Um, so again, how does this fit into our broader conversation we've been having? Most mass incarceration reform focuses on nonviolent offenders or drug-related crimes, in part because it's a little bit easier to do and there's less pushback from communities who can understand why reforming this might not cause them harm. When it comes to violent crimes, oftentimes there's still a focus on deterrence. Um, deterrence through punishment, deterrence through incarceration. And as Common Justice has, has found, and a lot of other organizations have found, that's not necessarily accurately factual, or it doesn't actually reflect what happens or what's motivating for people. So they offer this really interesting framework shifting from punishing violent crime to right, figuring out how to deter violent crime and then also repair the harm that comes out of it. We can't incarcerate our way out of violence and violence reduction is something that I think all of us really care about both for ourselves and our communities. A really powerful metaphor she gave was this idea of trimming and pruning a tree, trimming and pruning the criminal legal system while still letting it grow from the root. So no matter how much we trim from the margins, if we're still you know, watering and letting the plant grow, um, we're not actually getting to the heart of how we transform this structure or society. And so it asks the really good question of how do we upend our relationship, not just to the criminal legal system, but to this whole question of violence. And it's one I absolutely do not have the answers to. I've been thinking about it a lot. I look forward to continuing in conversation with you all as we explore how do we upend our relationship to violence. So what is restorative justice? At the root, it's an alternative to incarceration um, that builds practical strategies to hold people accountable for harm. It breaks cycles of violence and it secures safety, healing, and justice for survivors in their communities, which I think is a really important piece of this that's missed in some of the talk or discussion about the criminal legal system reform. How it works is two parties come together. I really like the language uh, Danielle introduces of the responsible party and the harmed party rather than perpetrator or victim. Um, and as we've talked about, right, language matters. How we think and frame these things are part of how we think culturally about this. So for today's conversation, um, I encourage us to think in that lens of responsible party and harmed party. The goal is to be restored to the community with accountability. So not just saying, I'm sorry, right, talking it out, but actual actionable accountability that transforms not just the, the responsible party, but the life of the harmed party as well. Um, and it's important, I think, to note that this process is only optional or available to folks with the consent of the harmed party. Um, so it's not something that can be imposed. It's something that survivors have to be able to engage in and want to engage in themselves. And as we hear in, in the podcast and as you go through their website, it sounds like one that a lot of survivors find really helpful in their own healing process. So there are four tenets of this are it's survivor centered, it's accountability based, it's safety driven, and it's racially equitable. That's another big piece we've talked about with mass incarceration, with you know criminal justice or criminal legal reform, um, that there's racism embedded in all of these systems. This is a way to try and get around some of that as we don't do more harm as we're working to repair harm. One of the things I think is really interesting as we talk about this idea of deterrence versus community harm, repair, violence, mitigation, 
um, is the practical reality that people come back home. And I think that's sometimes something that, you know, those of us who haven't gone through this system or, or don't know a lot of people who've gone through the system kind of forget um, is that there's a, a reality after folks leave the experience of being incarcerated. And as we learned from Will, as we've talked about before, it's really disruptive. It's really harmful to those individuals in the community. And if you haven't listened to the podcast, I don't want to retell this story, but I do want to point back to it. The story of the mother whose, I think, nine or 12 year old son had been harmed and, and violently assaulted. And she didn't right, she didn't care about um, the, the responsible party. It wasn't in, about him. But she had to ask herself, what's going to be best for my son in three years when this responsible party would theoretically be out of jail? What makes my son safer? Is it having the responsible party be in a jail with no resources and no support and no growth? Or is it having the responsible party go through this process of common justice, go through the accountability of the teaching, the education, the, the kind of process that leads to that repair? Um, so that way in three years, you know, when they were back on the street, everyone would be able to, to move on in a way that was really constructive. And I think that's, again, something that we don't think about a whole lot is what happens when people come back home and what's the impact of how we choose to hold people accountable. At the root of all of this, all of us want to be safe. Um, and there's, again, we talked about fear and the role fear plays in these systems and the cultures that lead to these systems. Um, it's hard to make good decisions or strategic decisions from a point of fear. So what can we do collectively to secure safety for the people we care about? I think one of the things we'll be talking about this summer too, as we dive into some of these different issues of violence is how do we reduce harm before violence happens um, through access to water, education, schools, community support, resources. What are the factors that contribute to people becoming instigators or people who are responsible parties? Um, it's also really important to note that a lot of people aren't a responsible party or a harmed party. Um, people who are hurt hurt other people. And so oftentimes, right, the very people who've been failed by not having any kind of community harm mechanism are the ones who go on to, to harm others. And so something like restorative justice interrupts that cycle and, and really focuses on how do we increase community safety reduce violence and harm before it happens, and then also mitigate the long-term effects for survivors. One of the themes we've been talking about as we've talked about uh, criminal justice reform, as we've talked about how we get from slavery to mass incarceration is the idea of cultural violence. I think this is a question that I invite you all to chew on today, but then also as you think about this beyond and as we go through this summer, um, how do we shift our thinking about the idea of violence in responsible parties? We talked about, you know, the tendency to write people off once they are convicted or once they are part of the criminal legal system. How do we shift that thinking about violence and, and people who are the responsible party and the harmed party so that it's not, well, one person needs to be punished and that punishment is going to help the person who's been harmed. But really, like, what, what are the root assumptions we're making about good people or bad people or people who deserve to be punished and people who deserve to be helped? And how can we, you know, not pass that down? the way that we maybe were passed it down to. Um, Danielle tells the really powerful story of her son learning for the first time that someone he knew went to jail and how horrifying that was for him because for him it hadn't been normalized yet. Um, and she says that anyone who's not raising their child to fight this is raising their child to accept this and that that's devastating. And I think all of us implicitly or explicitly have grown up in that in that culture with those narratives around punishment and deterrence and violence and good people and bad people. Um, and I think for all of us, it's really powerful to shift that thinking away from good and bad punishment. And, you know, you check your box, you've, you've created public safety towards something that holds a little bit more nuance around how are we actually focusing on community harm and repair, not only for the people who are responsible, but for the people who have been harmed. Um, I don't have all the statistics pulled up. I encourage you to look at Common Justice's website for some of their stats and reporting around um, how this really benefits survivors of violence because it gives them tools, skills, accountability answers that they don't otherwise get from the criminal legal system. Um, and again, it's it's a really powerful place to start thinking about this, um, especially as we shift into diving into some of more of that violence. So that's what I wanted to kind of say and frame up front some guiding thoughts and I'd love to spend most of the rest of our time in some community discussion. I know we're a small community, but uh, some great folks who've showed up today. So I want to start with, you know, for this episode, for this conversation about restorative justice, tying back into what we talked about with Will, tying back into what we talked about moving from slavery to um, mass incarceration today, all of this, 
what challenged you with these new ideas about restorative justice in the context of the conversations we've been having? And feel free to just jump in because we are a small group. Um, I, I can share a little bit. Um, I met this morning with a young man who is the director of um, this organization that goes into um, juvenile detention centers, kids 13 to 18, um, with mentoring um, and really coming alongside them, um, supporting them and also supporting their families. Um, he talked about um, also when if these kids are acquitted after they're given, after they, I guess, go into the, um, before the judge, then he has a um, moving business where he employs um, young men that he built relationship with um, so that he can offer that first job and then, um, you know, just start the way into um, becoming, uh, you know, responsible citizens. Um, we didn't talk about restorative justice. We didn't talk about harm and responsible, um, but you know, for kids age, and, and some of the um, crimes could be, you know, um, violence, um, you know, um, some could also be, you know, um, 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 incidents that did not involve another um, person. But um, I don't think, you know, the thoughts of, um, you know, harmed and responsibility and that accountability and how they could be feeling to the to the two parties involved. Um, we didn't enter into talks about that, but I've certainly having listened to this, the podcast and the interview, um, it did make me think about, you know, that aspect of how, how could you introduce this into this um, uh, organization's work that, that is, I feel, doing really good work. So, um, so I have this before me to consider, um, you know, I just met with him, so I have my notes. And so I do have to look at my notes and go on their website and then um, look at also common justices and, and just see if there's opportunity there. Um, yeah. So I'm very grateful. And this, this um, came at a very timely, you know, time for me. Mm. I'm glad, Sharon. Thank you for sharing. And I think like with that, even if we we don't have the power to institute a whole restorative justice process, um, like Danielle mentioned, using this with her kid, there's ways of taking the principles we learn or the, the ethos we learn from this and applying it in other organizations or in other areas, or even how we think personally about violence and harm and, and our relationship to it. So that's really exciting to hear. Anyone else, what, what has challenged you or what's excited you about um, the idea of restorative justice? Well, in, in Canada, we, it's a, we don't have the identical um, issues because, you know, y'all incarcerate like more people than any other per capita than any other country in the world. But um, in our country, indigenous people are the ones that are incarcerated way above their proportion in the population. And uh, restorative justice and this, this kind of uh, accountability is actually pretty central to a number of indigenous people's um, native systems of justice. So, uh, I guess the thing that challenges me is why is this taking so long? And um, given that, you know, indigenous people, not just in my country, but in yours too, had, you know, tens of thousands of years of culture here before the Europeans arrived and mucked everything up. Um, there, there's, I think a lot we can learn from the way that indigenous accountability circles and justice circles and things are done. Absolutely. And the, and again, it's the same. It's the same. The heart is the same. It's that the responsible person takes accountability, understands the harm, but the whole purpose is about reintegration into community. 
for both parties. Mm, absolutely. I find it interesting how much we just continue to live in the culture thinking like this is just how it's done and and it's kind of normal and all and I think I just become more and more aware of how off we are in so many um, ways cultural ways um, even when it comes to you know, guns in our country and how, how the world looks at us, our country and sees just how off we are. But it's just, it's just interesting how it's kind of like that frog in that boiling pot where it just, I mean, it can only get, I think the cycle can only get worse unless you keep um, interrupting. So I love Sarah, some of your terms, you know, just how can we interrupt or disrupt the cycle, mm -hmm. you know, it's just gonna take a lot of disruptions. I think how can we change our language, like you said, um, to responsible party and harmed party. So we can, I mean, all these things are cultural things that we don't have any other language until we start, you know, introducing these new, new things. There was a, you know, just downtown last night, there was a police car and, you know, just in a nice little area of, of where where we live and what's with the grandsons and oh cool there's a police car there oh maybe they're just kind of showing it to the kids that are you know in the area and so you you walk over to the policemen there's about you know five of them there everything was calm but um just to see that to see the car and he said well I don't want you to get any closer to that car there's a you know a criminal in the back of the car and we have a witness here that saw them do a crime and you know, I, I'm so thankful to tell us because I think my first thought again with that person in the back, I didn't know who it was, but just thinking more about the side of this person, why did he do what he did? You know, um, just like you said, um, hurt people, hurt people. I don't know if he hurt somebody or if he just stole something or what, but you just, you kind of just move into the compassion and you just hope that that person's going to be treated correctly in our system. Again, I didn't even see who it was, the age, the color, anything. But um, I just owe it to just these groups of thinking through things just to not assume what you know you kind of grow up assuming. So, yeah, thanks for sharing, Beth. It makes me think of of that practice of self interrogation. Um, yeah. I had a high school French teacher. I don't know why this was relevant to teaching French, but he always said, it's okay to be ignorant. It's not okay to remain ignorant. So mm -hmm. it's okay to not know what you don't know. But once you start unpacking, like how much we all still have to learn, that's when we come accountable to having to keep doing that self-interrogation and, and aligning our actions with our values and questioning the things that maybe we just, you know, grew up assuming. Um, I think Greg says like fish don't see the water they're swimming in until they're taken out of the water. Um, so it's it's really important to have those moments that do kind of not check us, but offer us that opportunity to think again of, oh, this was my first thought. What's my second thought? Or, you know, mm -hmm. this is my first reaction. How has that changed from what it might have been 10, 15 years ago? Um, what you were saying also made me think I'm not going to be able to quote her directly. But Danielle said something about um, shame, like shame makes violence possible. And the only way to overcome shame is accountability. And I think for me, Linda Ruth, that ties into what you were saying too about right culture and how we don't integrate indigenous cultures. And um, there is something about this idea of individuality and, and not a community ethic of everyone is our community. Um, that ties right into what we're trying to do with our, our bigger aim of restoring who we are. How do we tell a different story where right, we let go of the shame of, oh, that's a narrative I was raised on, or that's what I think about X, Y, Z, or while we incarcerate that many people, they must deserve it because otherwise I am part of a system that does that and it's bad. Like moving through that shame by self-interrogating, by saying, right, that's what I inherited. I'm not passing it on. Um, that to me is part of the accountability work we're all doing together as we try and restory and not just tell a different story, but figure out how we can act locally in our communities, but then also change that culture. So that way we can move away from systems that breed violence towards one that really do center community uh, community care and and healing mm 
Have you thought about the idea? Oh, go ahead, Linda Ruth. I was just wondering, so for you Americans, um, do, do you actually realize how incredibly individualistic your culture is? When when I, I went to America for grad school, and this was decades ago, right? And it wasn't very that even that far from Canada because it was in New England, which we always kind of felt like was almost Canada. And it was shocking to me spending a year in Boston how um, how much more individualistic American culture was than Canadian culture. So do y'all realize that? <laughs> like, I think you help point things out a lot. I love I love being on these group calls and hear some of the things you say because I love people from the outside just uh, pointing things out. So it's helpful. No, I don't always realize everything, but yeah, I mean, I do. Yeah, I do. I, and I don't. I was <laughs> I just actually, people. yeah, it's really interesting. I was just actually reading an article today um, from my grad school that was talking about how individualistic even parenting has become. And this uh, prof was ta talking about how as a society, as a culture, we've kind of abandoned prioritizing children, right? And we just dump it all on their parents. And if things don't go well for the kids, oh, well, they had bad parents. Whereas the a lot of the social constraints that we've been talking about also affect the way people can parent. And so that's really fascinating to me that other cultures have much more of a, you know, there's that African proverb about it takes a village to raise a child and they just have a much more community oriented kind of collectivistic um, approach to how important children are and they don't get abandoned to this kind of individualistic thinking, which maybe then feeds into gun culture, incarceration culture, like all of these other kinds of things. Mm -hmm. that, and I think at root of it, the root of it, <laughs> well, what this prof was saying at the end of it, he was saying, you know, what if even corporations were held to a standard of whatever they are doing, is it actually good for children rather than just profits and shareholders and things like that? And he, he said, basically, uh, and he's writing from America, like American culture is kind of abandoned children. And I think it's true. Sharon, did you want to jump in? Otherwise, I have something to say, but I don't want to cut you off. Oh, I was just going to say that, um, you know, um, we're reintroducing the theme of neighboring, you know, in our churches and our community gardens for that very reason. Uh, you know, for responsibility uh, for each other and that it takes a village. And so so I think we are becoming aware and we are becoming aware that um, if systems or um, if there are, is failure, it's incumbent on us, you know, to of, of what we have missed or what did we not engage in. And I, so I think that collective responsibility, I think, is now people are becoming aware of it, but it's something that we have to learn it's not something that we just, you know, just is going to come to us by osmosis, but we have to relearn and re-understand, which is why I think, um, you know, organizations like tell us and what you're doing is so important, you know, to give us the tools to engage in your peacemaking principles and practices, you know, have been um, instrumental, instrumental, um, Sarah, in, you know, how we engage. And so, um, so, I'm, so, so, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I think when you were talking about the shaming, I think like shaming and shunning and where that whole neighboring is including people. And so it seems like it kind of all goes together. If you're, yeah. yeah, it's kind of the shame is kind of the opposite of just welcoming and including people and neighboring people. Yeah, I think for me, Linda Ruth, I really appreciate what you've all shared. It ties for me into that question of who is our community? And as you both were saying, who is our neighbor? I think about my my grandfather, who's now passed on, but was kind of a, a classically conservative Republican Christian, had a lot of love, was one of the most generous people I knew to friends and family and people he kind of considered worth helping. And as much as I loved him, right, could also be incredibly judgmental about who was worth helping and who wasn't, or right, who was part of his community and who wasn't. So he would do anything for his church or his family. But community beyond that, like, that's where I think, not just for my grandpa, because I don't want to throw him under the bus, but I think for a lot of people, 
it's it's easier to start from a point of so you do care somewhere how do we expand that care to include more people how do we expand the idea of who's our neighbor um and I, yeah i don't have all the answers for that but i think there are there are pockets all across the country where people have that deep love and affinity and i have to be careful what i say about american individualism um, as a representative tell us on this call, but I, I think that there is something for that question of, right, all of these structures and systems from mass incarceration to slavery were designed to separate us, were designed to keep people from acting in solidarity and building those community bridges. And for me, that's what's so powerful about what we're trying to do at Telos is we're trying to form these communities across those lines of difference, right, breaking down the idea of, well, we all have to be the same, or you have to be part of my community for me to, to care about your flourishing, and saying, what does it mean to to not always actively embrace, but maybe sometimes passively accept some of those differences so that we can center community healing and well-being, so we can reduce violence and figure out how to be a community, even without being a homogenous community. And I think it's a really important question and, and one that we are not being encouraged to ask. Um, I don't love talking about toxic polarization in part because I think the more we talk about it, the more it validates like that's something that's real and exists and is going on. Most of the people I get to talk to are concerned about that. Most of the people I get to talk to hear that coming from news media or for people above them, but are still trying to figure out what it looks like to show up in community and to show up across those lines of difference. And yeah, I'll, I'll get off my soapbox. I want to hear what you all continue to have to say about this. Um, but I think that that is exactly part of this work is how do we expand that idea of who is our neighbor? What does it mean to show love to them? And, and how do we expand that definition of community that we care for? You know, it, to me, it, it's so funny in a way. Um, if some of you have heard maybe some of my story, you know, like I did, definitely did not grow up in a Christian home. I came to, I encountered Jesus, like totally grown ass with a lot of <laughs> degrees and uh, married and a child and everything and so it was always so interesting to me that that question um was asked of Jesus who is my neighbor and he answered it with the story that we call the good Samaritan right which would have been a shocking story for his hearers to hear because the Jews and Samaritans were very polarized and they really hated each other and so um it's it's kind of fascinating to me that in a in a country um, that is so quote unquote Christianized as America, that that story and Jesus's answer to that question of who is my neighbor hasn't had more like traction to um, toward inclusion and toward you know expanding the boundaries of of how we care about each other. So I always just you know again I just always kind of find that kind of funny <laughs> yeah for those of you who are interested I know Beth knows Andrew DeCourt but Andrew DeCourt does a lot of work around this idea of neighbor love and Beth I don't know if you want to explain that better than I am but um if that's something that resonates that question of what does it look like to do this from a Christian context because I know not everyone who's listening might identify that way but that's a really great resource to dive into some of these questions more explicitly as well yeah you know, Andrew DeCord is always his teaching and his com conversations with them is just so stretching. I just um, was with him um, while well, he was giving a, a, a lecture. It was a conversation with somebody about um, just violence and some of the, you know, some of the military focus as well. Can you, can you love your neighbor to death? Mm. <laughs> is it possible? Like military, can you? Yeah. And I just loved his focus. The other person he, um, you know, that was having conversation is, you know, kind of hired by the military to support, yeah, killing is okay, you know, and just there, we can justify, you know, it's a just war theory. And it was just very, very powerful, um, just for me, just to hear what Andrew DeCourt has to say especially I mean to me when you look at how Jesus looked at things and he, Andrew DeCourt is just wonderful how he um, expresses because he doesn't want to be so dogmatic either he's I think he's a peacemaker in how he talks that he wants to be inclusive in that conversation but man it makes me say hey if you know we got a break violence in all areas 
and especially, I mean, I, I think the whole military complex system is another place that needs a lot of help mm. that we do too much mutual. We do too much flourishing for one side, but don't really see the flourishing of the other side of the enemy side. Mm -hmm. Anyhow. Yeah. I say any, anything you can get your hands on and what he writes or speaks or anything is just worthwhile. Yeah. Um, thanks for sharing that Beth. And one thing I wanted to add, I actually got to uh, help staff a Telos trip in March with Andrew. Um, oh, he was a participant yay. to the South. And I got to read a little bit of his book, Flourishing on the Edge of Faith, and mm -hmm. listen to a couple of podcast episodes we had with him. But one thing he continually says is that when you love the enemy, you become the enemy. So mm -hmm. when you take someone and see someone who is otherized and seen as distant from you, then you're able to empathize with that person and relate to them. And then that eventually includes you in that. So at the end of the day, it's not necessarily like a very hopeful message because our work of peacemaking is not something that like you get everyone to rally around you. But in the end, it's a good call and it's one that we should think through truly. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Micah. That's great. Um, so, Sarah, you know that we did um, the book Reparation by Du Quan, our book club. We've been in a book club in New York City um, that um, includes um, different neighborhoods, different churches. Um, so the, book, the next book we're going to be doing is Ecosystems of Jubilee. Hmm. And so I think, and it was written by a pastor in New York City, a, a church in Harlem. But I think, um, you know, we, I, I feel coming from the Caribbean, being educated in the U.S., coming from a, um, a, um, a village where neighboring was most important. And I, and I look back at my mom now. She taught the whole village how to sew, you know, and how to do floral arrangements because she was just gifted. And I never really realized, um, you know, uh, I, I guess I never saw how integral this was into, um, in, into who she was and, and, and what it brought. Um, I just kind of poo-pooed, you know, that, but now I realize, you know, how important that was. And I realized that I am also trying to, you know, um, pattern my mom and my daughter, who's 26, is also trying to pattern me in terms of relationships, in terms of connecting. Um, and so when I came to the United States and I was educated, I, I kind of uh, turned away from that. And now, you know, I have to now be educated, which is why I point to this book, because I have to get re-educated into you know the whole um and what it looks like you know what neighboring what a building and, and and working towards building a just neighborhood in new york city what that means especially because there is such disparity in terms of affluence and then also in terms of poverty i mean you can see in one neighborhood you know um it, it's stark, you know, in some neighborhoods, you know, wealth and then just lack. And so I think, you know, um, you know, being a practicing Samaritan, like neighboring, it sounds good, but really it's, 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 it's interpreted through the lens. And I think we have to, you know, clean those lens and, um, you know, um, open up ourselves now into something that we probably haven't done before. And so, which is why I'm grateful for the uh, author you mentioned and also for books that are tackling these tough, you know, subjects and that we can do it together in community so we can hear um, all the different um, understandings. And the most important thing I think about our book club is it's mostly younger people. My husband and I are the older and we're learning alongside them. So I feel like in terms of generational um, payback, I think um, I, I love that young people are getting engaged in issues like this. Mm. Absolutely. One question I have too, and this is this is a question I'm genuinely asking as like a, a fellow learner on this journey. How do you all navigate the role fear plays in this and especially in bringing this to your communities? And I ask this in part because I was listening to the podcast at work 
And then I biked home and I biked by a street where, you know, a couple of days before someone was murdered during the day, during a time where I could have been in the area. And so like I've been navigating living in a city that right violence is up. Violence is something real that affects everyone. And I want all of my neighbors to live in safety without this fear of violence. And also I can see that conversation going very differently depending on who I'm talking to and what part of the city I'm talking to, what their background is. So what role for all of you does does fear play in this or these conversations about peace and justice being intertwined? Um, I'd love to yeah, hear any thoughts you all have about how this work has been going on in your communities or, or thoughts you have about as you keep bringing this to communities, what role fear and trying to overcome some of that fear has to do with it? Yeah, I guess, well, we're, we're having this conversation here in Toronto um, because we are going to be voting for a new mayor at the end of June. And so, um, so there's a lot of conversation amongst the different candidates about this. And I think the understanding that is growing is that more policing and more guns doesn't actually reduce violence. It increases violence. And so rather than uh, spending our municipal money, you know, like pouring, pouring a big chunk of it into the police budget, it would be better off to spend it in community organizations like, the, like what Sharon's doing right now in New York City. Community organizations, mental health services, like really um, a lot of services that actually support people rather than um, just pouring money, which feels like pouring it down a rat hole, just pouring it into more policing and guns. So, um, so sadly, fear is something that politicians use to try and get people to vote for them, right? So there is one candidate, he used to be a police chief, and he's like big on, you know, increasing the police budget, increasing more police officers. But most of the other candidates are kind of challenging him on that and going like, it's not really working. Let's look at how we can use our resources in other ways to increase the safety of all of our citizens. Mm -hmm. So I think just... So it's kind of good that we're in the middle of this election campaign because these conversations are happening. I would agree. I think these conversations need to just happen, you know, kind of in the everyday thing because, um, you know, statistics say that, you know, when more crime shows up, it's the Christians that are the first people seem to be buying more guns you know and which is so opposite of i think our faith and what we're called to do not fear so um and again like sarah unless you're in that you know none of us know how our response is going to be if we're actually in a harmful place you know we don't know that but i think these conversations are really really good um, you know, it's more likely, we know the statistics, it's more likely for uh, like a toddler or a kid in a household of somebody that has a gun to, for an accidental death of that child than it is that gun protecting from harm. I mean, those, those are straight out facts, it's statistics. So why aren't we more afraid of the harm of losing a child or a grandchild because of a gun in the house, then you know, then the other, our fear, our fears need to be talked about because um, that stat needs to be heard as well. So, what you just said, Beth, about oh, gun violence—that's one of the issues we want to talk about more directly this summer. I think in part because Linda Ruth, I'm I'm sure you see the headlines out of the U.S., but like every every week. Right. If Telus did a newsletter, we could include at least one news story in it every single week. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah, I don't want to say too much about that now because I don't know how Telus wants to frame that conversation. But I think it's one that comes back for me to that question of Linda Ruth, what you were saying about like caring about our children, right? Even if, even if I attribute good intent to folks, um, yeah, something something needs to change in terms of how we think about protecting. And again, I think it's rooted in that idea of community and, and neighbor. Are we protecting ourselves from people who we don't see as part of ourselves? Like there's so much at play that touches on everything we've talked about as we dive into each of these issues of violence and circumstantial factors that 
you know, also create violence like poverty and, and hunger and homelessness and all of those other things. Um, but yeah, it, I, I wish more people were having this conversation because to see what happens when we don't or to see the way people feel like they need to protect themselves because they don't feel protected by the community. Like, yeah, there's there's something there too about everyone is being harmed. Everyone's being let down when we don't actually address this in a way that focuses on whole community support, care, safety, and love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I always wonder if, if uh, more of us in the States, because again, Linda, I like you pointing things out from being outside of the United States, but um, my daughter-in-law's friend came and visited from France last summer and her brother called her like weekly to make sure she was okay. You know, we're in the suburbs of Chicago, but I think that there was even a warning, you know, like there always is a travel warning coming to the United States because of our gun violence here, you know, and like how, how many of my friends know, know that, that we're considered like, be cautious when you go to the United States because of, you know, of all the guns that are here. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard that before. Absolutely. Yeah. But <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like, I don't, most people that would have no clue. I think you, us here are always like more concerned, like about, oh, is it safe to travel to Nicaragua or is it close, you know, safe to get to go to Costa Rica or Mexico or, you know, if we're thinking about traveling overseas, but never thinking that people are asking those same questions coming here that are overseas. But, yeah. Or those are good. across the border, yeah. Beth. So my my daughter works remotely and so she can work anywhere. And so she has a, a number of American friends and they like to go to outdoor music festivals. And so she's actually going to America. Um, she's going to Boston in a couple of weeks because Niall Horan, I don't know if you all know who Niall Horan is. He was part of One Direction. And anyway, he's, he's uh, uh, somewhere on the Harvard campus near the B school. There's some kind of festival going on that's featuring him. And then later on, she's going a bunch of different places, Seattle, Denver, DC. And she has to text me every day. I insist on it. I want to know every day that she is safe and that she made it home. Wow. Yeah. Y'all could come to Canada. It's pretty safe here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I feel like I've been talking too much as myself, not as a facilitator, but Linda Ruth, like what you say and, and Beth, what you say about people buying more guns. I think that what happens with all of this is people do change their behavior. Like I, I change my behavior. Um, or if I don't, it's with the knowledge that like, when I go to concerts, I know where my exits are now in a way I never used to. I, I went to a production of Oklahoma and I failed to read the warning that there was going to be a gunshot. And like, like I had that physical reaction of like, oh my God, it's happening. Right. Like that fear I think embeds all of us and and how we choose to react to that is what we can kind of control whether it's buying more guns or or saying no I'm committed to like community harm mitigation or all of that but the thought that any of us exist outside of these systems or outside of these conversations or in communities where this isn't a problem for us like I think that's one of the things that's that's part of right moving through that shame into accountability and, and peace and justice is recognizing that we are tied up in this whether we want to be or not and pretending we aren't isn't actually keeping us or our families or our communities safer. Any other thoughts coming out of this conversation or any of the three conversations we've had about mass incarceration, slavery to today? We're not leaving these these themes totally behind, but we are going to be shifting a little bit more to um. Some of these conversations, right, heading heading all of this on more directly about violence. Um, so want to make sure that we're we're picking up themes that people wanted to to pull together or questions they wanted to ask. This is maybe going a little bit if farther afield than you want to go, Sarah. So that's okay. You can tell me just to shut up. But um I'm reading a really interesting book right now that somebody somewhere recommended. It's called The Origins of Capitalism. And so the professor is an economics professor and, it, and like not that I ever studied economics or know that much about it, but apparently the the kind of uh, 
the sort of prevailing attitude is that capitalism is an inevitable, it is natural, it is a good thing, it produces all these good things. And she's kind of challenging that a little bit. And I'm, I'm just this far into the book, but she's rooting it in a breakdown of relationship, which I think is very interesting given the conversations that we've been having and given maybe the connections um, that, you know, the kind of underpinnings of capitalism to slavery, to mass incarceration, especially in for-profit prisons, to the gun industry, to, you know, a, a lot of these different things that we're talking about. And, uh, you know, I, I know that maybe stepping on a lot of American toes because capitalism is, you know, next to God practically in America. But I, I think there could be some ways that we could be challenging the way, like, again, the individualistic um, underpinnings of capitalism and the way capitalism kind of uses people rather than sees them as neighbors doesn't really uh, encourage community. Anyway, that, that may be going way far afield, but I do think it's an interesting discussion. Linda Ruth, you're going to drag me there with you, and I try so hard not to be the theory nerd. But like, that, that is my bread and butter, so <laughs> um, I will be careful not to say too much. But um, that was, for me, a moment in, in grad school, right? I was interested in all of these questions and, and didn't have the framing or language to ask better questions yet. Um, one of the things that was like one of those aha moments was when I learned about neoliberalism and I promise this isn't like me climbing the soapbox even higher or maybe it is and we'll just all embrace that um, but it, it sees as its base unit individuals rather than communities and when that is like that water we're all swimming in or when that's the structure that orients everything around it that's the unit we care about it's not the family it's not the the town or the village um and one of the things that, I, oh gosh, I try so hard not to talk about both of my grandparents either, um, but my other grandfather grew up in communist East Germany. And this is where I have to be like, I am not a communist um, because this is recorded and going on the internet. But I grew up with his stories, right? About a community ethic where there are definitely things to critique about that system and he will critique it too. But my grandmother in Germany talked about, right? Like she was able to have a career and have a family in a way that my grandmother and my grandmother couldn't. And they would go potato harvesting or blueberry picking. Maybe it wasn't voluntarily, but everyone did the labor together and the kids were taken care of while they did that. Um, there were daycares, there were public education systems. And again, like so much to critique. Um, but that for me was one of those moments of the world, the way we understand it, isn't how it inherently always is. Like there are things underpinning the way our cultures are formed and our structures and societies are, and no system is perfect. But um, what would it look like to, to say we are intentionally leaving parts of this behind, we're intentionally embracing other parts of this, not saying, right, that like we need to all take any kind of political stance towards capitalism or socialism or communism. Um, but what does it look like to think maybe someone else has pieces of insight where our system isn't perfect and we could bring more of that in? And yeah, I, I did not want to end us there. I'm so sorry for pulling us in that direction. Um, but if any of you are interested in like talking more about neoliberalism or how those systems came to be, love to continue that conversation offline. Um, Cause it was one that really helped shift my thinking about like, right, we see the world the way it is before we can transform it, seeing the world slightly differently and, and less, well, this is how it's always going to be. But that's not a great transition to invite anyone else to comment. I'm so sorry. Um, any other thoughts before we move towards closing our time together? The one thing I'm reminded of in every learning course session I've been a part of and helping to take notes at is just the importance of listening to other people's stories and how life-giving that is for both you and that person. So like in today's episode of the podcast, Yuri, I was able to learn much more about a specific person's story and then also learn about how to learn more about an issue from that and had I not done that and have you not lean into that scenario you're leaving much else left to be learned so I'm going back to what I believe Sarah mentioned earlier it's okay to be ignorant but it's not okay to remain in it, um to paraphrase it's but, a great place yeah. to end Micah thanks for sharing that I'm going to stop the recording there before anyone pulls me further off, off in the wrong direction.